of not being able and not straining to make a sole perpetrator finding against the mother rather than straining to exclude the father from a pool into which he had been placed before a conclusion had been reached. But the better point, or the even better point, I would say, on that front is for the reasons that I hope to develop. This judge did engage with the question of whether a sole perpetrator finding could be made against the mother in respect of the older injuries. And it's quite clear from the judgment that the judge's starting point was whether a sole perpetrator finding to the civil standard could be made against the mother. Having engaged with that question, but the judge then addresses whether or not it could be said that there is no real possibility that the father Well, that's caused the other the way around, injuries. isn't it? He's got to engage, not whether... Well, whether there no... was a real possibility that the judge, forgive me, lady, caused the older injuries. And there is a peculiarity, if one likes, about these cases where the pool or potential pool can only comprise two individuals. That's Lord Justice Peter Jackson's point, I would submit, in Re B, about the inversion of the coin. Where is a judge to go if the pool at its height could only comprise two people and the judge has, met, has, has decided that he can't make a sole perpetrator finding against person A? In those circumstances, a two-person pool finding must flow. And I rely on the observations in that respect made by Lord Hoffman in Re B, my skeleton at page three, the citation reading, if, for example, it is clear that a child was assaulted by one or other of two people, the fact is that one of them did. And the question for the tribunal is simply whether it is more probable that one, rather than the other, was the perpetrator. That citation is in my document. My lady, in cases where parents in a two-person pool have something to hide, the court may well be told very little to assist in differentiating their roles. Where two parents have been dishonest with the court and evasive when challenged, where there is a closed shop, if I can put it that way, and a lack of candour and openness in describing what happened in a household behind closed doors such that a child suffered here older injuries, the court will always be in a difficult position. In those circumstances, the court will rely on and should rely on an analysis of the totality of the evidence before it and, perhaps critically, the impressions made by the witnesses when challenged about these matters. It is far, far from unusual in such cases where a two-person pool case comes before the court and there is parental evasion for the judge to have almost nothing by way of hard fact to latch onto in order to make a sole perpetrator finding. Plainly in those circumstances, the judge is not constrained to dismiss the local authority's case on the basis of opportunity alone. Plainly, the judge in those circumstances is not constrained to make a sole perpetrator finding, for all the reasons I've already articulated in terms of not straining. But the judge, nonetheless, has to do his or her best with the totality of the evidence and the impressions 
that the witnesses provide during the course of evidence. We say this judge has done that. In some cases, milady, there will be a striking similarity between different types of injuries caused at separate times. Older injuries, acute injuries. If, I, I, should, I should probably say by way of a rider on this, milady, and you will know this point well, that it, it's often the case that a child will be admitted to hospital, for example, with a brain injury as a result of a shake. And the doctors will be able to provide very specific information about timing because of the development of the brain disturbance and encephalopathy, the adverse symptoms that led the parents to take the child to hospital in the first place. And the doctors will usually say, the point at which the child ceased to be normal at home marks the point at which yeah. the injury occurred. That's very, very standard paediatric and neuro neurosurgical knowledge in these cases. Then, as here, doctors do further investigations and they discover older injuries. Those injuries are extraordinarily difficult to pinpoint because the timing window, the, the fracture window, if it's a fracture, the head injury window, if it's an older brain injury, one can't acquire the same degree of specificity as one can when there's an acute head injury. So in those circumstances, parental evasion, obfuscation, wish to hide the fact, pre presents the judge with an even more difficult challenge in trying to grapple with the need to identify a sole perpetrator, if one can be identified. Not least because the evidence going weeks and months back will not allow a court, in the vast majority of situations, to, to know who had the care of the baby at the point the injury occurred. So all I want to do, milady, is to try to underline the difficulties that face this judge in grappling with the sole perpetrator issue. Sir Mark Potter, the former president in re T, another authority I referred to in my document, which I don't want to spend time by taking you to now. Uh, I'm not relying on it for its facts, obviously, but the president in that case, uh, underlines the distinction to be drawn between a situation where there are two injuries of different timings but of the same type. So feeding back to what I've just been saying, for example, two shaking injuries, or here, where there's an older a fracture and a head injury and an acute. I, 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 I saw in your skeleton argument you, you sought to say, well, they're all of different types, so you know, it could be two different perpetrators. I'm putting it crudely, yes. but that's it. But I'm afraid I, you're going to have to persuade me about this because, in my experience, A, you very often get there's innumerable different forms of frustration injury. And the fact that the final injury was unusual doesn't, in my mind, put it in a different category it still seems to me to be a, a, um, an unusual but classic frustration injury. Well, and lady, I wouldn't in, not... on the live, sorry. sorry, and I just wouldn't on the live stream elaborate as to why it seems to me that that is the case. And if you are seeking to say that they are not all frustration injuries, and so they're completely different and should be regarded by the court as completely different, you'll have to persuade me. Lady, I entirely agree that they may well be all frustration injuries, and I understand perfectly why your ladyship makes that point. Um, my point, my submission on this, is that where there is a striking similarity about the type of mechanism employed, the judge might be more easily able to make a finding that the perpetrator is the same. I'm sorry, you're going to have to persuade me about that as well because you often see um, a head injury but with old rib fractures. And, and, and that doesn't stop you making a finding of perpetrator, single perpetrator. Oh, my lady, I'm not suggesting it would stop the judge in any... But it doesn't make it more difficult. Why does that make it more difficult? When, it... when there's an a well-known in this sad world... <laughs> of types of injury and forms of injury and means of injury to, to these babies. Lady, I'm not saying it makes it very difficult or out of reach or anything like that. My only point is that if there is a, a similarity of mechanism employed for an earlier and an, uh, a, 
a more acute injury, then that might be an additional point that a judge could plead in support of an argument that a single person was responsible. I don't put it any higher than that. And lady, in this case, there were a range of factors available to the judge when determining perpetration of the older injuries. This was not a case in which the judge's determination in that respect rested on mere opportunity. And I deal with the factors that are apparent from the judgment in turn. The first issue with which the judge squarely... Sorry, just take me to the paragraph in your scope argument, please. Just for my note. Is it 14 onwards that we're looking at? So, your leadership wants internal page references, is that right? Well, paragraph. Paragraph. Forgive me. So, we are looking at paragraph 11. Which relates to the judge's analysis of the weight that could be attached to the earlier finding against the mother of the 3rd of April. I have said in our skeleton that the appellant comes close to arguing that the finding made against the mother on the 3rd of April leads to, almost inevitably, a sole perpetrator finding on the older injuries. I may be doing the appellant a disservice when I put it that way, but certainly they argue that the judge did not apply sufficient weight to the earlier finding on the 3rd of April. In my submission, that argument is not made out. The judge explicitly deals in the judgment with what he described as the inherent improbability of the father causing these injuries in the context of the wide canvas of evidence and my findings about the events of the 3rd of April. That is in the judgment at paragraph 91. At the bottom of the page. And on the following page, at paragraph 92, the judge comes back to that point, mid-paragraph, when he says there is an innate attraction to concluding that the mother was responsible for all of the injuries, given that I have found her to be responsible for the events of 3rd of April 2021. Milady, we say that that is exactly what the judge should have been doing. He is not only flagging up that he has made his mind up about the 3rd of April, but he is acknowledging the force and attraction of the appellant's argument that that should therefore lead to a sole perpetrator finding, implicitly a sole perpetrator finding, against the mother in respect of the older injuries. And therefore, it becomes a question of weight for this judge. How much weight should he have attached to his 3rd of April finding? In my submission, that is a decision and evaluation with which this court should be slow to interfere, given how explicitly the judge acknowledges how attractive the argument would be to make a sole perpetrator finding against the mother. My learned friend, at his height in his skeleton, argues that the judge did not undertake the task of considering whether a sole perpetrator finding could be made against the mother. In my submission, at least those two paragraphs, 91 and 92, that I have already taken the court to, demonstrate the judge did just that. Indeed, he says, six lines from the bottom of paragraph 
1992, to identify the mother as the sole perpetrator would be straining too far beyond what is evidentially sustainable and would be based on no more than speculation or conjecture. So we invite this court to reject the assertion on appeal that the judge did not have at the forefront of his mind the need to engage first with whether a civil finding could be made against the mother alone for the older injuries. The next issue, my lady, relates to credibility. There is a suggestion within the appellant's argument that the judge's acceptance of the father's account in relation to the 3rd of April somehow insulated him from criticism or findings of adverse credibility on the other evidence. Learned friend argues that the judge found the father to have been inherently honest in respect of the events of the 3rd of April, but to have colluded in respect of the earlier injuries. Learned friend argues, thus, it is a contradiction which makes little sense and would require clear explanation. In my submission, it isn't a contradiction that makes little sense. Because, of course, the judge is entitled to reach an adverse view about credibil credibility in relation to issue A and to find that a party or a parent has not told the truth in relation to issue B, which is what the judge did here. The difficulty we say on this appeal is that the judge squarely found the father to be evasive in relation to the older injuries. Just, that fine. just, just tell Sorry. me about that going to the transcripts again. Uh, the way you've put it is evasive in relation to the older injuries. Or do you mean evasive as to the atmosphere and what was happening in the household? I mean in relation to a host of issues, including the atmosphere and what was happening in the household, the complete absence of any change in presentation in the child. That well, we, might... do, we do have the paediatric evidence in that respect that the judge didn't refer to. Well... I want to address you about that. May I do that now? And, and, and I don't want to take you out of your course. All right. Well, I want to come on to that in due course, because I, I do say that the judge was entitled to conclude that the pain and the discomfort exhibited by the child after sustaining the fractures and the brain injuries would have put the parents, both of the parents, on notice that something was wrong. The expert evidence did not establish that parents in those circumstances would know that their child had been injured and suffered an injury. But the expert evidence did establish, we say, and I'll take the court to the extracts in due course, did establish that there would have been a worrying change in presentation. And the judge had all that in mind. So coming back to this question of credibility, the judge found the father to be evasive. That finding was not the conclusion simply of what the father said. It was a, based on how he said it and how he responded over a number of hours to questions in cross-examination on a host of issues. And I repeat that, plainly from our point of view, this court should ask itself how appropriate it is to turn, overturn a, a factual finding of evasion when it's based on a lengthy consideration and an analysis of what this judge decided, having heard the father give evidence at length. So I approach this appeal on my 
client's behalf, as I must, on the basis that the judge did find this father evasive in relation to causation of the older injuries and a range of other issues relating to the functioning of the household. The appellant places very significant weight on the positive credibility findings made in relation to the 3rd of April, but then in effect, we say, invites the court not to place weight on the judge's findings that the father was evasive in relation to the other issue. In my submission, the judge had to take both of those findings on credibility into account. He had to weigh up the honesty in one respect and the dishonesty or evasion on another and reach an overall assessment on this issue of whether a sole perpetrator finding against the mother could be made. The judge did that. The judge did that. And he concluded that he couldn't make that finding without straining to do so. The next point, milady, is that we say the judge plainly addressed whether there was a real possibility that the appellant was responsible for, forgive me, the older injuries. And I look at the judgment at paragraph 92, if I may. The second sentence of that judgment reads thus. Some events are so improbable that when considered against the weight of the evidence, it will be excluded as a possibility. In my judgment, this does not extend to the arguments that are advanced by the father in this regard. We interpret that passage, milady, to mean that there are some circumstances when considering a pool of perpetrators where someone's inclusion in the pool is such an improbable event that they will not form part of the pool because there is no real possibility that they could have caused the injuries. In that sentence, the judge engages with the second part of the re-B test. I know I have said that rejection of a sole perpetrator finding on the re-B test in a two-person pool leads almost inevitably to a pool finding. But were that not enough, one has here the judge asking himself if there is a real possibility that the father caused the older injuries. And he says in terms, in my judgment, this does not extend to the arguments that are advanced by the father in this regard. So the judge covers both bases. And accordingly, we submit, milady, that the judge does engage with the re-B test. It may not be there with the formality and the structure and the discipline that we might have seen if there had been a citation within the body of the judgment rather than a code. But it is there in substance in the document. The next point, milady, is in relation to the argument that it is inherently unlikely that there were two perpetrators. In my submission, that issue is always a question of weight in these cases. Inherent improbabilities or inherent probabilities must always give way to the evidence. We know from the citations I've already given that the judge, in fact, referred to the inherent improbability or the argument that there was an inherent improbability that the father was responsible for the older injuries if the mother was responsible for the 3rd of April. So plainly, the judge had in mind those improbabilities, but ultimately they gave way to the other factors on which he relied to make the pool finding. So those factors included both parents maintaining an idealised portrait of family life, both parents keeping a closed mind 
as to the possibility that the child had become injured in their care. A clear finding that the father had become evasive during the passages of his evidence when he talked about the discussions he had had with the mother. The appellant is wrong to suggest, we say, that the judge just ignored the oral evidence about discussions between the mother and the father. In fact, we can see in the judgment at paragraph 93, at the bottom of the page, the judge said it, it would be entirely unrealistic to expect that the parents would not have any memorable discussions about A's injuries. In his oral evidence, the father came close to giving some information about some relevant discussions that soon became evasive. The judge, we argue, the lady, did not need slavishly to refer to each and every part of the development of the father's oral evidence in relation to the discussions he had with the mother. He's recording in plain terms that the father, to some extent, engaged with the questions I asked him in cross-examination about the discussions he had with the mother, but that ultimately the judge's conclusion was that the father soon became evasive when probed on those issues. But it is not right to say that the judge ignored the discussions that took place. Going back to paragraph 72 of the judgment, which is a passage relating to the chronic older brain injury. Perhaps easy to miss this, but one can see in paragraph 72, five lines in, importantly, neither parent has reported a change in A's behavior or anything that may be consistent with encephalopathy. This raises two possibilities. Firstly, that there was no associated encephalopathy, which would lend support to this being an unusual or unknown etiology. And of course, I pause there to observe that that was not ultimately the finding the judge made. Or secondly, the parents have withheld relevant information about A's presentation. This brings the importance of the parents' evidence into sharper focus. So to be clear about what that point means, founded as it is on the oral evidence, neither parent gave any oral evidence at all about a change in the child's presentation during the long injury windows for the fractures and the chronic brain injuries. That was out of kilter with the expert evidence in relation to presentation. And the judge rightly flags up in the passage I've just taken the court to that the absence of reported evidence of presentational abnormalities or encephalopathy brought the importance of the parents' evidence into sharper focus. So when the judge comes later in the judgment to analyze the parents' evidence and finds the mother's highly unsatisfactory and finds the father evasive overall, he is fully entitled, we say, to place significant weight on that combination of factors when determining that a sole perpetrator finding is not open to him without straining. Lady, I move on briefly to ground four, which is a complaint that the judge placed excessive weight on the absence of direct evidence. That is a reference to paragraph 91 of the judgment, E50 of the bundle. The paragraph opens with the observation that the parents have given little evidence that's been helpful or realistic. Mid-paragraph, the observation that the only individuals who could have caused the injuries were the parents. And then there is no reliable direct evidence that would allow me to distinguish between the parents and to come to a view about which of them may have inflicted these injuries.
there is nothing wrong with that passage or that expression. No direct evidence. It's a matter for this court, of course, but surely the judge is referring there to the absence of confession, absence of a witnessed event, the witnessed aftermath of an event, so on and so forth. He is not, the judge is not in that passage saying <coughs> at all that he has not factored in the findings regarding the 3rd of April when determining causation of the older injury. That can't be the case, particularly since in the preceding paragraphs and the subsequent paragraphs he engages with the question of soul perpetration. I move on to ground six and seven of the appeal, which relate to collusion and a failure to protect. Paragraphs 94 to 96 of the judgment, the closing three paragraphs, demonstrate the judge, perhaps briefly, but nonetheless still undertaking an analysis of the factors that lead him to conclude that the parents had colluded in giving an account to the court about the child's older injuries and that there had been a failure to protect. A number of factors arise. They were living in close quarters. They were sharing the care of the children. They will have been very aware of each other's attitudes and treatment of each of the children. It would have been highly improbable that the parents had no awareness of any changes in the child's presentation, reaction to pain and feeding, given the number of significant injuries. The relationship between the perpetrator and the child would have been highly dysfunctional and obvious to any non-perpetrating parent. And then finally, neither parent had given a truthful account. So there's a host of factors that are cited by the judge in support of a finding of collusion and failure to protect. We say, Milady, that it must be open to a judge to find that the relationship between a parent and a child would be obviously dysfunctional, where that parent had caused a succession of injuries to that child. That must be judicially permissible, and was therefore but one of a number of valid factors cited by the judge in support of his conclusion. I've referred within that list of factors to the child's reaction to pain and the child's general presentation post-injury. There are a number of sources for that. One has Dr. Alu's evidence, the transcript at G8. There are three passages in Dr. Alu's evidence in which she deals with the child's reaction to different older injuries, starting at G8. And to be clear, the way this part of the cross-examination came about was that I put to her some of the um, opinions given by Dr. Fairhurst, who was the consultant radiologist instructed by the police, whose report we had, but who was not called to give evidence within the fact-finding hearing, to see if Dr. Alu would agree with Dr. Fairhurst's observations. So we start at the top of page G8 with Dr. Fairhurst's evidence that at the time the metaphyseal fractures occurred, I would expect the child to have shown immediate distress lasting between 10 and 15 minutes. I would expect this distress to manifest as crying. So, Malay, that doesn't take the point much further forward because the non-perpetrating parent might well be out for 10 or 15 minutes. But then we come on to the next extract from Dr. Fairhurst, with which Dr. Ali says she agrees to a certain degree. Metaphyseal fracture may cause discomfort for several days after it has occurred. 
and this discomfort may manifest as whinging when the limb is moved or simply as the infant appearing more grisly than usual. In such circumstances, I would expect any regular carer to notice a change in the infant's behaviour, although they may not attribute that change to an injury. Looking at the numbers in the left margin, Dr Ali then goes on between numbers 21 and 25 to say it's difficult to be able to pinpoint to what it is or what the, what the, what the carer is likely to notice if there's been a bit of a change. So a child who is maybe more settled will be less settled. A child who is usually unsettled, maybe even more unsettled. But being able to attribute it to a particular cause at that time, given the age, can be very tricky. And then right at the bottom of the page, last three lines, my point here being even the almost lack of clinical presentation of the injuries, even the perpetrator might not be aware they've caused an injury, so I just wanted to make that clarification. That's the first passage. And then the second passage within Dr Ali's evidence is at G41, the second half of that page. Which I won't read out in full, but spilling over to the page after that, even as clinicians, we don't pick these fractures up in children who are brought into hospital until we have the x-rays. It's clearly your view that someone who wasn't present may well not have known that the child was injured in terms of having fractures. The answer to that is no. We have absolutely no difficulty with that answer. But the distinction that needs to be drawn is between a non-perpetrator who knows that the child has been injured, or more specifically, knows that the child has, been, has had a limb fractured, which is not, a, not necessarily going to be the case. And on the other hand, a parent who knows that something is wrong. There is distress, there is pain, there is discomfort in a way that appears to have no explanation. Well, I'm not sure about the pain and discomfort because what she said earlier on at G8 was, you know, babies are funny old things. I think most people in this room would probably understand that, you know. Settled babies suddenly are unsettled. Why? Well, no idea. They just are. For, for, for sure, Melinda. And I don't... So are you saying that... What we have to do is put a sharp focus on the fact that you wouldn't know it was injured. It should nevertheless, even with a, a highly premature baby, it should, if there's a change in presentation, they should be suspicious. Not necessarily suspicious that the child had been injured, but should seek medical help and get more... Uh, seek medical help? when it... Potentially. This is a child, m'lady, and I, of course your ladyship knows this, but this is a child who has suffered multiple fractures yeah. on at least two separate occasions, plus older uh, brain injuries. Yeah, terrible, terrible injuries. So our, our point is absolutely not that the non-perpetrating parent should be on notice that the child has suffered an injury. That is not the evidence. It's not the expert evidence that the evidence is that there would be a noticeable change in the parent that would prompt inquiry. And the point is that neither of these parents gave a jot of evidence that there was any cha change in the child's presentation at any stage. And that deeply troubled the judge. It contributed to the judge's overall conclusion that the parents were being evasive and they were together presenting a closed picture of what was going on behind closed doors in this family's life. The other final passage in Dr. Ali's evidence, my lady, is yes, G66. Mid page. What we do know is that when they sustain such injuries, they're painful. So at the point of injury, they're likely to have cried for some time. Subsequently, they may be, whichever, they may go off their feet, they may cry if they're handled in particular ways, it moves the area that's been fractured. But they're all very non specific, isn't it? Because Babies of that age cry. Babies of that age are irritable. So, except, you know, you don't know how they are likely to be present. So that repeats and really sweeps up the other points made by uh, the doctor. The other source of information about the older brain injuries comes in the experts' meeting from Mr. J. J. Mohan, consultant paediatric neurosurgeon from the John Radcliffe who gave evidence, but whose transcript you don't have. But your ladyship will see his input on presentation in the middle of page 
274. Right at the back of the supplemental bundle. I'm not sure whether it's E15 or 274. If both numbers are there. In the middle of the page, the initial JJ, Mr. J. Mohan, says, I think that given the widespread nature of the changes, so he's talking about the changes on the brain, on these brain scans, this isn't just a single part of the brain. I think this would have been likely accompanied by an area of a period of brain dysfunction, so irritability, crying, possibly floppiness, going off feeds, vomiting, not right, and probably very clearly not right. The further supplement to that would be, of course, should someone have known. I think it would be fair to say that the person who did the shaking should have known that something was clearly wrong with the child. Would somebody who did not know about that realise that something serious was going on? That may be more difficult to say. So I think the person who did the shaking, assuming the court finds there, was, should have known that something serious was going on that the baby may have been irritable, but not enough for somebody to say we have to take this child to hospital and then over a period of time may have recovered hours and days. So, Milady, just drawing those points together, if I may, we have the evidence from both the neurosurgeon and the paediatrician that the existence of an injury may not be obvious to a non-perpetrator. We have the evidence of Mr. J. Mohan that it may not be apparent to a non-perpetrator that a child should be taken to hospital. But apparent from both the evidence of Mr. J. Mohan and Dr. Alu is that the child is likely to have been behaving abnormally. And it's the disjunction between that common expert observation and the parental evidence, which was that nothing sprung up at all to put either parent on notice that the child was injured. It was that disjunction that helped the judge to conclude that the, there was a failure to protect here and that the parent knew what was going on. Of course, the judge built into that equation other factors, such as the family's circumstances, living in a small property, jointly caring for the, ch for the children when the father was not at work. There was evidence about the dom domestic dynamic, in, which is one of the points your ladyship raised much earlier. It might have been relatively contained evidence, but contained. Milady, uh, if we look at, first of all, uh, bear with me. If we look at paragraph 88 of the judgment, One sees the judge's summary of the evidence he heard from each parent about the domestic arrangement. They were jointly cared for, the children were jointly cared for by both parents until the 15th of March when the father returned to work. So he was around until the 15th of March. On the parents' evidence, they continued to jointly care for the children, with the father regularly visiting the home during the five days that he was at work and assisting in the evenings. During the remaining two days, father stayed at home, sharing the care of the children. But to, just to unpick that slightly, because it's, it's a slightly unusual setup, the evidence was, that the judge is recording here, that during his working day, the father would return home during the day, one or two times, to be with the mother and the children. And of course he was there. What was it that... Where did I read then that he home for 10 minutes to allow her to collect or deliver to nursery? Yes, that will be in his own evidence. 
or the mother or the mother's evidence. They both gave evidence about it. So the mother, for example, at G one five two. This is the agreed note rather than the official transcript. Okay. A third, two thirds of the way down, asked roughly how many times the boys went to nursery between the girls being born and coming back from hospital, between that period and the husband going back to work. A few days, not many days, some days I wouldn't send the boys to school. This was about um, the mother leaving the house to take the boys to nursery, leaving the father alone with the children. And then a Father says, in addition to times when you took the boys to school, there would have been two or three times where you took the boys out to the park to play. Yes, so that's about father's soul care. Um, well, don't worry, I'll be able to find it again when I'm reviewing the evidence. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. But the G90, the known friend says. That's right, thank you very much. So from halfway down that page, he took time off work from when the girls were born. That's at number 21. Sorry. Um, G90. Yes. Margin number 21. And then 25, so he would come home just after 5, would he? That was his normal working hours, but his job was local. So he would come home once or twice during the day as well. At 31, why would your husband come home during the day? Well, he leaves for work in the morning at 8. What time do, you, do the boys need to be at school? And then that discussion uh, develops. Yeah. So he's coming back from work in the middle of the day to take the boys to school. Sorry, I'll start again. He was coming back in the middle of the day so that the mother could take the boys to school and he would stay with the children at home. But, but the bottom line, lady, is that the father is spending as much time with the children as he can, notwithstanding his work shifts, and he's there for the weekends. They, this is a joint caring setup when he is back at the house. Well, it is and it isn't, and I, I, I don't want to. Um, difficult about it but my understanding is that after the March 15th when he went back to work after his paternity and extended sabbatical the mother was the primary carer in that she was there five days a week with brief interludes which to allow her to take the elder twins to, to nursery but very significantly she did the nights so Shared care, <coughs> helping to care. I, mean, I don't want to split hairs, but, but to my mind, that, that it is significant that the roles each played. I'm saying they didn't each play their own roles fully, and the father was obviously a devoted, caring father. But the fact remains that the mother was doing substantially more of the care of these premature twins, night and day, than the father. <coughs> Maybe. I, we, I agree with that. And we don't collect that from the judgment. Lady, I agree with that, but to jump from that to a sole perpetrator finding... I, I'm not saying you do, but I'm no. just saying, you know, it might form part of an analysis. Well, it's a factor... Particularly when you've made a finding that the nearly fatal injury was caused by the mother when she had sole care at night. There was evidence that the father would help in the night when required to, and therefore would be up on the scene involved in the children's care in the night. The difficulty, I would say, Malay, is that to go from time to time from when time she time. called him. Absolutely, but the difficulty to go from that to a firm sole perpetrator conclusion is it requires a degree of speculation, and it must be a question for weight of, of weight for the judge with all the other factors. But if it's not factored in at all? I would that a deficit in analysis? Well, I would suggest that it would be 
fairly harsh to assume that this judge did not have in mind the balance of care, which plainly fell more towards the mother than the father when making his overall determination. Thank you. My lady, I see the time, but I have oh, all, yes. all but finished my submissions. The matter for the court whether I finish those now or at two o'clock. How much longer have you got to go? Uh, I should think five minutes. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll rise now in any event because we have to hear from the Guardian and then we have to have a short reply. So it just allows you just to. I don't want to rush you. Is the court. I'm, I'm sorry, my lady, is the court now sitting at two o'clock? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.